Well, good afternoon and welcome to Arizona Community Grand Rounds for April 2002, April 6, 2002. Um, we will introduce our speakers in the session today, uh, but we'll give folks uh, a few seconds to connect to rounds. Um, as if you're new to rounds, I'll just might note that th these rounds are held monthly on the first Wednesday of each month uh, as our current schedule from noon to 1 p.m. Arizona time. Uh, rounds are uh, co-hosted by the NARVA Institute uh, and Health Choice Arizona, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona. Uh, uh, Mary Jo Gregory, President and CEO of the NARVA Institute, um, is joins us for all the rounds and just her, her leadership and development of these rounds is much appreciated by myself. And if I haven't met you, my name is Mark Carroll and I'm the Chief Medical Officer for Health Choice, the Medicaid segment for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona. We're always looking forward to the monthly topics um, that we identify and your ideas about topics and presenters for future sessions. So if you have ideas during today's um, session, you'd like to answer them in the chat or Q&A, please feel free to do that. You're also welcome to send inf ideas to me or any thoughts or comments you have in general at mark.carroll at azblue.com. Uh, please enter in thoughts and comments on today's session uh, and questions that you have as we go through the presentations for today in our panel conversation. Uh, and we will answer them without disrupting the flow of today's presenters. Before I present today's presenters or introduce them, I'd like to just share with you next month's topic. Thanks, Jen. Uh, Jen Pierce uh, runs slides for us and, uh, and I wanna thank Jen for the great help that she offers these rounds from a telehealth and technical perspective. But Dr. Marianne Mikowski from Stanford uh, will be offering the presentation in May on nutrition in the brain. Uh, and uh, with the title, uh, as, you, as you've note here of nutrition, mental health and coping with stress, Dr. Mikowski is a national leader uh, in this space. And some of us have been fortunate to get to know her through some of the work that we'll actually reference today. So I will introduce today's presenters. Um, uh, in alphabetical order, and they will present in alphabetical order. Uh, but as always with rounds, we promote a fluid conversation. So some of the presenters may ask each other questions as we go forward. Um, each person will present for about, about 10 minutes or so. We'll do Q&A and during that um, in, the, in the space between if there are questions and then leave plenty of space at the end. Um, but uh, our first presenter is Dr. Teresa Birch. Um, I'm gonna read from my notes. So if you see my eyes looking off, I'm reading from their lengthy and impressive bios. Um, all four of these leaders in healthcare um, have super impressive backgrounds and bios, and we're so fortunate to have them with us in Arizona and with us today in today's rounds. Dr. Birch is a board certified psychiatrist who is the vice president of medical affairs for the NARVA Institute. Since, since 2018, uh, she's been the CMO for NARVA's affiliate, the Guidance Center, a psychiatric hospital and Behavioral Health Center. Uh, Dr. Birch has received many awards, one of which was the Arizona State Behavioral Health Leadership and Services Award uh, from ASU in 2015 uh, for her participation in designing and delivering innovative behavioral health systems and her lifelong dedication to public service. She received her bachelor's and master's from Stanford, uh, completed medical school at Case Western Reserve School of Medicine and her psychiatry residency at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine, where she was chief resident. Um, Dr. Terry Pipe uh, is with us today also. Um, Dr. Pipe is Dean Emerita of the Edson College of Nursing and Health Innovation um, at ASU, uh, where she served as Dean from um, 2011 to 2018, and as uh, Arizona State University's Chief Wellbeing Officer from 2017 to 2021. She's the founding director of ASU's Center for Mindfulness, Compassion, and Resilience. Uh, previously to working her work at ASU, she served as a Mayo Clinic, uh, Arizona's director of nursing research and innovation for 11 years. Um, Dr. Pipe uh, is expert in multiple areas and speaks in multiple topics, both in Arizona and nationally, but a couple of key areas um, relevant to today's conversation are mindfulness, um, and mindfulness as a skill to increase our ability to experience fully, be present, um, alive, um, and, and have that be supportive for, 
for healthcare professionals. She's an expert and very actively engaged in nursing leadership, as you can tell from her extensive background. And she's often sought as a speaker on topics of mindfulness, workforce resilience, and self-compassion. Uh, Dr. Pipe um, earned her PhD in health policy and administration uh, with a minor in gerontology from Penn State University, a master's degree in nursing and with an emphasis in gerontology from the University of Arizona, and a bachelor's degree in nursing from the University of Iowa. Dr. He Heather Rabin uh, has worked in the field of organizational psychology as a physician coach for over 18 years. Uh, although her passion is working with all healthcare professionals and leaders, her expertise is in coaching, particularly for residents, physicians, advanced practice providers, and healthcare teams. She offers powerful interventions that build personal and professional success and produce long-term results. Um, using organizational psychology methodology and coaching, uh, Dr. Rabin simplifies complex issues and, and provides individuals and groups the tools they need to achieve optimal, sustained results and accelerate their development to achieve their highest potential. She's a national presenter, uh, likewise with multiple areas of expertise, uh, and in particular content expert in communication, physician burnout, conflict resolution, compassion, fatigue, awareness, and emotional intelligence. Uh, and most recently, Dr. Raven completed the Chief Wellness Officer course at the Stanford Medical School. Our final presenter today, but equal part of our panel conversation is Dr. Cynthia Stonington. Um, Dr. Stonington is a professor of psychiatry and previous chair of psychiatry and psychology at Mayo Clinic, Arizona, where she remains an active staff member. Her current leadership efforts at Mayo are concentrating on the well-being of staff and learners. She serves as the Associate Medical Director of the newly formed Office of Joy and Well-Being at Mayo Clinic, Arizona. She's also Director of Research for Ignite Med, a national program for medical students geared to preparing and supporting women with the tools to thrive in their subsequent training and career. Um, Dr. Julia Files was moved to start this nonprofit organization after she and Dr. Stonington co-edited a book in 2020 on women physician burnout. Um, Dr. Stonington completed her medical school at Mayo Medical School in Rochester, New Hampshire in 1986. Her residency in psychiatry at Stanford and a clinical, I get that right, excuse me. I, my, my eyes went to the wrong line, Cynthia. Um, residency in psychiatry at Stanford University Medical Center and a clinical research fellowship in brain imaging at the University College London's Welcome Trust Center for Neuroimaging in, in the year 2007. Um, I abbreviated um, some of their extensive and impressive bios. I'm so pleased to have them join us today for this important session uh, on evidence and well being comprehensive models for best practice approaches to health professional fulfillment. And I enjoyed the opportunity to read just a little bit of their impressive history for you before we begin today's session. So, Jen, I think we'll begin with Dr. Birch. I'll bring up uh, uh, Dr. Birch's slides. Uh, and while you're doing that, I encourage all those who are joining as you have questions for today or comments for any of our presenters and panelists, please enter in, them into the Q&A. So, Jen, when you're ready, we are as well. And uh, Teresa, I will turn it over to you. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm really happy to be here with all of you. I was reminded that um, when I was thinking about what to talk about on this presentation that I gave the second grand rounds um, for this organization back in the summer of 2020. And at that time, my presentation was on, um, would healthcare worker burnout be the next wave um, as a result of the pandemic? And I think that certainly um, it has been, and that's why we're having this conversation today. Next slide. So the World Health Organization defines burnout as a workplace difficulty. So it results from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. And people have feelings of energy depletion or exhaustion, increased mental distance from their job. So they feel negative, they feel cynical, 
um, they don't feel effective in their job and they don't feel like they get a sense of satisfaction from their work. Um, and so while individuals are the ones that are actually experiencing it, it really is workplace um, that has to be able to address those things. Next slide. So when we think about how our whole response to the pandemic has gone, our number one public health strategy is isolation. And previous research has shown that low social isolation, low social interaction um, is really similar to smoking quite a few cigarettes per day, drinking alcohol in a high level, not exercising, and it's twice as harmful as obesity. So it can cause all these different adverse effects. And we now have the multiplication of that. Next slide. So really interesting studies that have been done on loneliness um, show that it really affects us physically as well. And functional MRI studies suggest that loneliness increases our attention to negative social threats and self-preservation. So there's this negative feedback loop um, such that e people even feel more social rejection. Um, they're less able to take the perspective of others. And all of those things contribute to burnout. Next slide. And one of the things that we need to work towards and really address is that a lot of the solutions for burnout um, have focused on the individual. And for people who are already feeling burned out, that can really reinforce their isolation and their loneliness. So some of the things that workplaces can do, and the rest of the panel has lots of examples of how they're working on these things, is to really reaffirm um, people's own social networks at work. So um, this can help congeal and solidify some of the areas that um, can be really supportive for people. So offering opportunities to connect with coworkers, um, having meaningful mentorship at work, and having leadership really demonstrate that staff are valued. And we need to also look for the people who already are having symptoms of burnout because studies show that they are the least um, able or willing to take the steps to engage in some of the burnout uh, work activities that we offer to folks. And so reaching out with resources to those folks um, and on an individual level, being present, mindful, um, that giving a kind word or positive attention to a coworker or a supervisor can really help people with burnout. Next slide. So some research on burnout shows that the things that an individual can do is really, if we target it to the different symptoms of burnout, that we can have a much better effect. So people who are feeling exhausted, um, which, which we could call a depletion of mental or physical resources, those folks doing active self-care, like meditation, um, napping, preparing nice meals, those kinds of things. In studies, it's shown that if they were to focus on that for 10 minutes per day um, while they're having um, difficult times, that the next day they had significantly less burnout symptoms. For the folks who have cynical detachment, so that would be like a depletion of social connectedness, having those people have compassionate acts for others can be really helpful. And it was interesting when they had that same group of people try to do acts of self-care, it actually had little effect on their own cynical detachment from work. For the people who have low efficacy or agency, so that would be like a depletion of self-value, they feel like they don't have anything to offer. Um, those people, if they can increase their sense of personal value by establishing some goals for themselves, some personal goals, exercise goals, that that can be really positive. But the most effective acts are if they um, have acts of compassion towards a coworker and then they get an even better boost if then that is acknowledged back with gratitude so that that person is thankful back to them. Next slide. 
the kinds of things that organizations can do that can be really helpful um, and have evidence behind them is to frame the struggles of the workforce burnout as belonging to the organization or the group as opposed to the individual. And so this really improves um, people's creativity in solving problems. It decreases blame and shame. Um, it improves people's feeling of inclusion in organizations. And I think a big one um, was just addressed by our Arizona Medical Association and was passed by the government that we need to remove the barriers for physicians to seek help in credentialing bylaws. There are a lot of physicians out there who have resisted doing activities that help with burnout, like getting counseling or coaching, because in licensure that we all have to go through, um, there's been very stigmatizing language about having to report mental health treatment in the previous five years and then actually list out where you sought treatment and what you were getting treatment for. And so that was a big barrier to um, physicians and physician assistants to be able to seek out help. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement has a really great um, body of knowledge and they've combined lots of different studies on what works for burnout and they call that psychological PPE. Next slide. And here's a graphic of it. And so I suggest that people go into the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and look at these and you can link to all of these different studies that back up their recommendations. And so I've highlighted the ones on here that we've already talked about today in my presentation and in the subsequent presentations, even more of these will be discussed. Next slide. So two areas in Arizona for peer support that I just want to give a plug to um, are the RN Connect, and that is a support program for nurses, and then the Arizona Medical Association Virtual Doctors Lounge. And that is for um, now, it, it has been for physicians, and now it's expanded to residents as well, um, medical residents. And that is to be able to have a physician coach who's a volunteer to be able to help support people. And you can get to that through their website. Next slide. And so now I'm going to pass it on to the next presenter. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Birch. Um, again, if folks have questions, um, comments for Dr. Birch or any of the presenters, please feel free to. Um, put them in. A couple of folks have already asked about slides. Um, I, I neglected to mention in my long intro that we are recording this session and the slide decks will be posted on the NARB Institute website. Um, we'll put a link into the chat uh, so you'll know where to find that. And it'll take us a couple of days after the end of the session, but we'll make them available. In the meantime, if there's something that you would like sooner or need sooner, please feel free to reach out to me. Well, thanks, Teresa. Really appreciate that. I think we'll I'll turn the platform over from remember my alphabetical order to Dr. Pipe. Terry, Thank thanks, so for, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be here. Uh, and Jen, you can just go right on into the next slide, please. So when we think about uh, strategies to address burnout, um, May, those of you that know me know that we'll be talking about the individual level interventions in just a while because mindfulness is um, something that I've been working on uh, for many years, but it's become clearer and clearer and clearer to me that we can't just talk about the individual level. We have to talk about systemic issues as well, and that goes for the organization and society as well. So when we talk about individual level interventions, they are very, very important, but they are, they are necessary, but they are not sufficient. So when we get to the part where we're talking about individual level, please hear that uh, that doesn't mean that one is more important than the other, they're all important. Uh, and there are more and more um, resources coming to help with um, not only individual level, but systemic and organizational uh, burnout issues. Uh, next slide, please, Jen. Uh, 
Thank you. So I wanted to highlight a recent publication from uh, colleagues whose names will probably sound very familiar to those of you in the Valley. Uh, they published this paper about uh, nurse well-being in October of 2021 uh, in the journal Nurse Leader. And they really highlighted the fact that when WHO made that transition in, in really talking about burnout as uh, going from an individual level concept to a you know, from a medical condition to an occupational phenomenon, it really opened the door to a lot of organizational interventions. And so they compiled this list of um, strategies that organizations can use. So just highlighting emotional exhaustion, uh, some things that can help with emotional exhaustion, reduced workload um, and, and taking breaks. And this is you know, not only within the work session itself, but also through restoration of um, days off and maybe even a vacation. Um, and these things have been almost treated as a luxury because we've been just pulling all of our resources together. But thinking about the present and the future, if we can uh, organize work, so that we can give people a time away from the stimulus, a time away from the stress, that's very, very uh, helpful. And then creating a culture of well-being, where um, you know, responding in a way that is restorative is seen as just as valuable. Um, many of us grew up in a culture where working hard and long hours was really valued. It was kind of a, a badge of courage. A, of honor. And so thinking about ways that we can talk about our well being that also uplifts the, the culture. Uh, depersonalization and cynicism. Um, I think, you know, from a leadership standpoint, really looking at responding to traumatic stress and calling it out as such, really treating it seriously. And uh, making avenues for authentic connections through peer support and leadership support, very important. And then uh, lastly, this idea of really giving recognition where recognition is due. And again, um, you know, as Dr. Birch mentioned, this could be something very simple of expressing gratitude, or it could be something on a, a grander scale. Um, I think the, the key here is finding out what's meaningful to people and going what, with what means the most to them. All right, next slide, please. Uh, over time, when our yearning to connect um, is interrupted, or when our standards of our own personal standards of ethical care is interrupted or uh, not made true over a, a time period, this really guides us to numb, numb this pain, this suffering that we're um, experiencing. And some of these number, numbing behaviors can be, if they're used in the short term, can be very self-protective. But what happens over the long term is that when we disengage repeatedly over a long period of time from those things that really uh, create meaning and joy for us, it also means that we're numbing down to the, the wonder in life and the awe in life. Next slide, please. So when we think about um, mindfulness or being present in the, the moment with all of our focus, all of our awareness and intention, uh, we really see this as not only at the individual level, but um, reaching out to from the self to others, the community and broader humanity. So this is uh, something that was created out of our Center for Mindfulness, Compassion and Resilience by uh, Nika Gwechi and Tira Cash in response to the fact that um, not only the pandemic, but uh, social unrest and uh, pollution, not pollution, sorry, climate change, uh, you know, planetary distress, all of these things are happening. And so mindfulness is a way to create inner uh, health and well-being and balance and awareness, not only to the, the suffering, but also to the joys in life. But it doesn't stop there. You know, it has these big ripple effects. Next slide, please, Jen. So when we talk about mindfulness, I often use this quote that is not mine, it's Viktor Frankl's. He was a concentration camp survivor and uh, wrote um, many subsequent works, but one that I highly recommend is Man's Search for Meaning. It's a uh, transformational book. And in it, he talks about how he realized that 
through deep suffering and in this um, situation where he had very little control of his external circumstances, he learned this, that between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. So when I think about mindfulness, this is the very best explanation of it that, that I've seen. Next, please. So mindfulness has the ability to take us out of an automatic uh, reaction to stress and place just a moment, if not longer, of time and awareness in the equation. So the first line here is our automatic response to a stressor. The second line is when the stress occurs, you'll notice the stress didn't change, it's still there. But with mindfulness, we can choose our response. And in that response, we have agency and a bit of more power and influence. Next slide, please. So we have this center at ASU, but it's not confined to ASU. So I want you to note the website, know that anything that is on the website is free of charge. Please use it. It was created with you in mind. Uh, we, we really create and curate uh, content to be used through, throughout the community. And during the pandemic, we found that it was actually being used throughout the world, uh, which is, is wonderful, I think. The reason for that is that we all um, learned that we share suffering in common and that if we can do that uh, facing of life together, it makes the suffering a little bit less and it makes the joy and meaning a little bit more. So next slide, please. So when I talk about mindfulness, we also, you know, we can practice mindfulness in day-to-day -day life. It doesn't mean sitting on top of a mountain or on a beach for an extended period of time. Although if you get the chance to do those things, please take advantage of them. Uh, but mindfulness is a skill set that we can apply to day-to-day -to -day activities. And here are some examples for you, again, with links that you can access uh, later at, at your, on your own uh, anytime. Next slide, please. So I thought that we could uh, do a very quick practice here. I know mindfulness is usually thought of as being slow and taking your time. And when you can, that's great. But let's just practice right now, all of us, this, the first one, which is the five, four, three, two, one experience. So we're going to use your senses as a way of refocusing your attention. So this is to get you out of your thinking academic minds and into your body, into using your senses. So right now, look around you and see five things. You know, just look at five things in your environment. Notice their color, their texture, anything that you can bring in through your eyes. And then listen to four things. What four sounds in your environment can you pick out? And then moving quickly, three, what three things can you touch? This might be your clothing, your chair, something in, on your desk or your environment. What can you touch? Two, what can you smell? Are there any ambient aromas around you? And then one, what can you taste? What's the taste inside your mouth right now? So all of these simple to do, really fun to do with kids, with teenagers, with uh, patients, with families colleagues bringing us into our awareness of our body through our senses. Uh, the second ones there are second and third, stay where your feet are, getting your, your mind from your head into your feet, and then square breathing, which is a breathing technique that many of you are probably accustomed to, just a, a square inhale, hold for four, exhale, pause for four, and uh, over and over again, just kind of uh, going through that square can really help your nervous system get a little bit more balanced. Okay, next slide. We're coming to the end here. This is Midday Mindfulness. These were uh, YouTube videos that we produced every single day during the pandemic uh, for a year and a half. So we have, you know, 250 some hours of content. And again, these are free of charge. You can use them in your organizations. Uh, they're listed on our website and you can cut and paste them as you wish. And these are just some of the topics. And with that, the last slide is a few resources, uh, references, 
And then uh, at the very end, just my email address. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. That's a quick walk through mindfulness. Terry, thank you so much. Um, thanks to both you and, and, and Teresa. Uh, again, if folks have questions or comments, please um, please send them along. And if, if you know my phone and wanna text me, which some people do, that's fine too, as, as a question. Um, as, as we transition to the next speaker, I just want to note a couple of things of interest. You both talked about identifying and using practices that work for individuals as well as organizations uh, and culture changes when we consider that individuals are organizations and, and not just part of those organizations. So uh, that's so very important, which is why we entitled today's panel focusing on um, the, the evidence related to systems as well as individual uh, caring. Um, uh, just a couple of notes, uh, Terry, I like um, the, the phrasing of be gentle uh, with central presence, uh, being gentle with oneself. Uh, I've carried around Viktor Frankl's book for many years. It took me many years to understand it, um, to let it settle with me a little bit. It's very short. If folks haven't read that book, Man's Search for Meaning, uh, originally published, I believe, in 1946. Um, I'd recommend recommend doing so. And uh, Dr. Birch, you had mentioned the important work um, that's gone on in Arizona with the language change for the application and the renewal application for licensure for physicians with the Arizona Medical Board. And um, I just wanted to um, give a shout out to Dr. Jasleen um, Chotwal and to a number of folks with uh, organizations such as the Arizona uh, Medical Association uh, who helped lead that work forward. Um, and there was a lot of support provided by, um, by folks on the panel today and hopefully and probably many folks joining this. Um, so just a few quick notes. Um, uh, before we transition to Dr. Rabin, um, any questions from my panelists of, of each other for either Terry or Teresa? Okay, we'll keep going and then we'll have a dialogue as we, as we continue on. So um, Heather, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks for being with us today. Absolutely, thank you for having me. Um, next slide, please. So my role was introduced um, into Dignity Health uh, within the Western Division um, about two years ago. And we learned pretty quickly that there was a lot of work that could be done uh, both individually uh, also, obviously, within our teams, within our departments, culturally, and then also importantly to impact our system. Um, so I started a lot of the work that I do, um, and this is just kind of a little menu, if you will, of, of what services I offer um, and just the approach really that I take. And um, our idea and what we do is to provide an evidence-based framework um, in order to really pilot um, scale, and then of course sustain opportunities for professional fulfillment within our organizations and within our system. Um, next slide. So uh, we measure and monitor uh, well-being by utilizing the well-being index for both uh, physicians, employees, uh, nurses, and our APPs. Um, and we utilize that data as really a guide to help us with decisions that we make within departments and then also, of course, within the, within the system. Um, we also utilize the Professional Fulfillment Index and some questions from that index in our um, in employee engagement survey for both our employees and our physicians. Um, and this allows us to, to get another snapshot of how our employees are doing, um, how some of our departments are doing, and then work on it uh, really with a more focused and different, different level. So taken in consideration of the data, uh, what we do is we utilize that feedback to take very targeted approaches in order to impact, um, again, um, our healthcare professionals on an individual level, um, our systems, our um, processes sometimes, and really just impact um, the culture and, and really shifting towards creating that culture of care. Um, so in order to do this and, and 
clearly very early on, we had to offer a lot of education opportunities so that people had a better understanding of really what professional fulfillment means, why this is important, um, and really educating people on some of the opportunities, um, especially with leaders, to get them to understand the importance of this work. Um, at the same time, we've had a lot of recovery work that's um, being done and has been done um, clearly because of what we've gone through just as a culture and, and um, just as really a system with the pandemic. Next slide. So um, since August, um, I, I work both individually with our physicians, our nurses. Um, I have uh, coaching that I offer um, to our healthcare professionals. And you can see just through those numbers that um, we've done a really good job just overall decreasing the stigma um, because many of our healthcare professionals um, self-refer. So oftentimes when I'm introduced to one of our healthcare professionals, it's because they have reached out to me. Um, and we've done a good job just as an organization by letting people know that the resource is available, but then leaders have done well with decreasing the stigma, really just focusing on wellness and well being and just talking of it often. Um, again, with the idea of decreasing the stigma. At the same time, um, I offer many workshops to our healthcare professionals, uh, mostly with teams, and then we'll offer it um, system wide. Um, the most a common workshop that I'm doing right now, again, in the name of recovery, um, is a lot of work surrounding post-traumatic growth. Um, and then um, obviously just re-empowering and rebuilding people's skills and just kind of dusting off some of what was important prior to the pandemic um, and giving them that empowerment through uh, good assertive communication and other skill sets. Um, some of the programs that we've piloted and that we're working on scaling, um, we have a peer support program that is being scaled. Uh, we started it in the East Valley um, and we're moving it to other hospitals and other parts of our system. Um, a big focus of ours is retention. So we have a new grad check-in um, where I and a group of leaders meet with our new grads um, uh, after they've been with our organization for two months. And essentially, we just check in, see what the pedals are in their shoes, um, making sure that they're supported. My dog says hello. Um, excuse them. Um, and we, also, we we appreciate the, the, his commentary, and, and 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 we're so impressed by how you just kept going. So I, I told them not to say anything. But it, it's pet therapy, team. It's pet therapy. Um, and of course, um, just as we all are, we're really trying to incorporate um, robust wellness into our residency programs and not just really focusing on the resident, but then we can't forget about faculty. Um, we've had a lot of debriefs, a lot of retreats, and then again, um, with our teams and departments, um, just a lot of targeted work that's being done right now. Next slide. So the approach that we're taking, and if you wanna just go ahead and click through this, um, Jennifer, that would be great, thank you. Um, so uh, much of our work was designed with consideration of the Stanford model of professional fulfillment. And um, I'll speak on the well-being model that um, Common Spirit is using here in a second, but primarily the important takeaway here is we learned also just as many of my colleagues have, have mentioned that we know that the personal resilience aspect of professional fulfillment is one leg of the stool. So we do work individually on the person, of course, but then also we take into consideration the culture in which that healthcare professional is working. We have to also consider leadership. Um, are their voices being heard? Do they feel supported? And then of course that leads us into efficiency of practice. We have to consider the pebbles that are in our healthcare professional shoes and taking a very targeted approach to try to minimize those pebbles. Um, this is when we take into consideration staffing, of course, our EMR struggles um, and just some of our team-based care opportunities. Next slide. Um, so with the framework of the Stanford model, um, Common Spirit has recently also adopted their own take and um, really pathway considering our, our values and really our, our core purpose with what we're trying to do as a system. So you'll see in this that 
Um, much like the Stanford model, many of those other aspects that have to be taken in consideration um, are being valued and focused on just within our system. Again, considering all of these factors. Next slide. So to give you a little bit of a flavor of some of what we're doing, again, the goal being professional fulfillment, which means that I love what I do, who I do it with, and who I do it for. So we're really trying to build that culture of care um, through, uh, again, professional fulfillment, which we know impacts engagement, decreases burnout, increases loyalty to the organization. So we're really working on a targeted approach ensuring that it's sustainable, making sure that we're measuring it appropriately, and then of course being willing to make changes as we go based on feedback and really the measurement that we're using with our healthcare professionals. Next slide. So lastly, much of what we're focusing on right now are some of those foundational programs um, again, making sure that we continue to work towards some leadership development, um, ensuring that our leaders know the importance of role modeling well being, incorporating wellness, and really that culture of care into their leadership um, styles and techniques. Um, making sure that we continue to create a varied pathway approach so that. We're really getting to our healthcare professionals in many different ways and shapes and forms to improve their professional fulfillment. Um, making sure that we're decreasing that stigma, which I think the pandemic on its own has done a lot of that for us, but we still want to make sure that we're offering people the opportunity to reach out for help, know that that doesn't mean weakness, um, and really continue just to discuss well being and wellness as much as we can to decrease that stigma. Ultimately, what we're looking to do is to really shift um, our culture and truly transform it to where everything that we're talking about is part of how we do business, it's part of what we value, and it's part of what we make sure that our employees know how important they are. Um, and truly, we, we are giving everything that we can to helping them sustain that. I believe that's my last slide. Thank you. Thank you, Heather, and um, appreciate so much of what you've just mentioned. And, um, again, that the, the the critical interplay between systems and culture and systems and individuals in those systems. And you said something I wrote down, just reminding us, training, helping us learn. And some of us, such as myself, continue to learn to ask, asking for help does not indicate a sign of weakness and how we incorporate that into our training programs, which you all are doing is so impressive. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Cynthia, Cynthia Stonington um, is, is ready to uh, offer our last formal presentation before general conversation. Uh, Cynthia, I'll turn it to you. Well, thank you and thanks for the invitation. Um, I think we've hopefully convinced everyone that a systematic approach to well-being supported by evidence is, is what, what we need. Um, for anyone who uh, trained in the 70s or 80s like me, um, I was given a, a copy of the House of God um, as an intern in the, in the 1980s. Um, knows about this book, but um, basically, if you haven't read it, um, it's a satirical novel that was based on real events during the internship year, but really depicting a power over hierarchical system whereby members of the subordinate group get isolated, not only from each other and from friends and family, but from the authentic experience of medicine and its values. Um, and so that each started to think, I am crazy rather than this is crazy. And in fact, um, one intern lost his life to suicide because of that. Um, so, you know, we made progress um, in the sense that there were actions taken after that, such as work hour limits for trainees and whatnot, but we unfortunately got very further away from connections with each other and relationships with patients and, um, and when productivity and procedures became 
king and we were drowned in clerical work demanded by our electronic medical record as we've already talked about. And so really, again, since particularly since the pandemic, we've started to see a pushback to get to really start focusing on what matters most. One example of that is the Clinician Experience Project. If any of you haven't seen that, please Google it. Um, there's a number of wonderful, lovely learning modules and short videos um, put together by Stephen Beeson, who's a family medicine doctor, just to really kind of you know, reinforce that sense of authentic connections with, with yourself and, and others. And the other piece that's really important that we've already kind of touched on in the previous uh, talks that I'm going to just maybe go into a little bit more detail is about the authentic leadership. About a, a year and a half ago, I um, informally polled a number of Mayo Clinic chairs, and I was really just interested in how they were handling their team's demands at home with online schooling, sick family, options for flexible schedules, what they were doing to build camaraderie and team building, whether they were recognizing people, how they were doing it, and then how they were just acknowledging the struggles. And then how did they balance that with um, their productivity needs? And I was, as I was getting, taking in this qualitative data, I started to see that there were kind of two types of leaders. And as I uh, describe these two versions that I discovered, um, I just want you to think about which kind of leader would you prefer and which is, do you think is going to be more successful for it with retention, better able to respond to the challenges that many of our healthcare professionals are facing, particularly those, you know, juggling um, with this domestic responsibilities as well. And so leadership version one, I mean, this was an, for example, one leader telling me how she, in the very beginning of the pandemic, you know, we're, they were having regular meetings to, to communicate what was going on. And, and so in preparation for that, they sent out um, anonymous surveys so that people can, can sort of ask questions and say things that were going on. And she started to realize, oh my goodness, you know, people are saying things that they probably never would have said if it weren't anonymous. And she recognized that that was such an important bit of information and particularly things like that I'm doing that are getting into people's way or what she needed to do to pivot to really hear and understand their, their, their actual struggle. And so she continued to do that even after that was you know not as needed from the pandemic point of view. Others were talking about the need to really just be humble and 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 just and recognize that that they didn't know every, all the answers and to share some of their vulnerability. Um, the others others recognized that the the study that Tate Chanafelt had done in terms of showing that if you are spending less than twenty percent of your time on on things that are meaningful and purposeful in your work, you're gonna be much more likely to have burnout. And so really wanting to, to uh, coach people, their team members in, in terms of what was going on and how can they help them get to what they wanted to be able to do. The other, and this is the other version was really the more typical type of leader, I would say that we've tended to, to pick someone who's really, really well versed in, in their field, um, you know, lots of, lots of expertise, they tend to be someone who maybe is feeling a need to have to have all the answers, they tend to be a little bit more um, contingency based transactional in the approach to that they get to people to do what they think needs to be done and what the institution needs, but not really taking the time to really hear about their lived experience to have people really feel like they are seen and heard and valued. And of course, that tends to stop people from giving you really important information and 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 for them knowing really what's going on and, and risks, I think, retention. And this is really talked about a lot in, again, Tate Chanafelt's recent work that I would encourage anyone to read on wellness center leadership in ac academic medicine that was published uh, last year really talking about how important it is for leaders to not only take care of themselves, for instance, in the ways that, that have already been talked about, but to rely on intrinsic motivators to drive results so that 
that's going to be much more likely for people to take that extra step, not just for themselves, but for their patients and for their team members, as opposed to those um, extrinsic motivators. And we've already also talked very much about the importance of supporting networks. And I just can't emphasize that enough. One of our biggest resources is each other. And it's really surprising how often we don't leverage that resource, partly because we grew up in a culture, as we've already talked about, that placed a premium on being tough and getting through the roughest moments um, on your own with the subliminal message being that you're weak if you express any sense of needing. Well, we've all decided now, I think since the pandemic is really noticing the impact of loneliness and stress that we can't, you know, that's just not the way we're gonna operate. And so um, like, like at Dignity at Mayo, we've definitely ramped up a lot of infrastructure for supportive networks with peer support at all different levels, um, which is much a, a formal pro program where anyone can, can activate support for uh, after a stressful clinical event, but also really normalizing the importance of reaching out and supporting each other. And we having lots of other formal ways through um, support groups, through Schwartz rounds, through SOS rounds, which support ourselves rounds with the, 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 the um, chaplains do. Um, but really there's so much evidence to, to, um, so, to uh, support that, that, those kinds of interventions. And this is um, just, I'll just end with this model that, that we at Mayo in Arizona started to create again, based in part on the Stanford model that, that uh, um, Dr. Rabin talked about, which for us, we decided to um, say, well, what we're gonna do is gonna be rooted in the Mayo Clinic values. So all of our, our thoughts are, or actions are, are rooted in our values. Um, but we have three main branches. One is engage and empower. The, third, the second is lessen the burden. And the third is peer support and community connections. And these leaves are the tactics um, or interventions that we that maybe will drop off or change or change in color, depending on, again, as, as Heather pointed out, um, what you know, after you're you're taking the pulse and measuring whether or not it's effective or wh where the needs are, um, but um, all of these tactics are things that we have done and or are are training or planning to do, including um, a fourth branch uh, related to training and sustaining efforts that are that are successful and 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 importantly, really training leadership to promote well-being and to recognize the importance of of well-being and making that taking that little bit of space for rest and recharge or doing things like integrating well-being measures within their regular meetings etc with that i will end and stop sharing dr stein thanks so much um boy what a lot of wisdom in a brief period of time from such phenomenal leaders um uh, i'd like to ask mary jo um Gregory, President, CEO of NARP Institute. Mary Jo, your reflections, comments, and questions? Well, I would just first of all say thank you so much. I was touched by the expertise um, today, wrapped so authentically in kindness and generosity. And I think this is exactly what we need to be sending to each other and to the communities that we serve, that, that this this opportunity is there and it is just in simple areas of kindness. You don't have to have a special degree or a special program. Some of the things you all mentioned are things we can do every single day at home as well as in the community. And I think that's the brilliance of it, um, as well as some of the more sophisticated things that all of our companies are doing. So I just would express my sincere gratitude. It's just wonderful. Yeah, thanks, Mary Jo. Kindness can be a culture and it can be a, not just a system value, but it can be built into how systems organize and operate. Um, I put in the chat a link for folks who may be interested to uh, uh, the, the Arizona Wellbeing Collaborative for Health Professionals. Um, all these presenters are actually key developers and voices and contributors in that, that collaborative, as perhaps are some of you who are participating today. Um, this is a growing 
um, initiative, um, and as my colleague Keith Frey likes to say, a movement um, um, in Arizona. And we're fortunate that my colleague Keith Frey has joined us, um, who's been part of developing this. Um, uh, Keith, any 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 comments or reflection from you, and uh, after hearing such great presentations? Oh, just thank you, Mark. Just terrific presentations, and maybe just not to be redundant, but just to emphasize. Um, we're all in this together. Everything that you've seen is shareable. Um, we're all learning together and that's, we're really trying to create a sustainable, extensible model. So we need your voices. And I think the second thing I would say, um, as Terry has so beautifully said, is we do our self-care. I mean, all 60 participants here, we're all leaders. We may not have a title, but uh, as a clinician, you're a leader, you're an influencer. And uh, I think particularly as uh, Heather and Cynthia shared, be very mindful about connecting with people and reaching out and really trying to, um, as we come to this recovery phase, really try to be mindful about the relationality that's so important uh, as far as what we do. So that would be my comments, Mark. Terrific presentations. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Frey. Um, again, if folks are interested or not, not you'd like to learn more, please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us um, and others who are, who are part of this um, uh, growing um, dialogue, partnership, and collaborative across the state for all health professionals, including folks in public health and all lines that relate to not just healthcare delivery, but um, the promotion of health and well-being for, for everyone in our communities. Um, I, I was struck by a few words today, if I just may, um, uh, uh, note them, um, and because they're all part of this, and and you've all so beautifully demonstrated how they can be worked into systems, large and small. Um, but but meaning, um, culture, cultures of caring, um, uh, being gentle and kind, um, growth. There are growth opportunities here, uh, professional fulfillment, um, as well as burnout. Those are two concepts that are both very real and, um, and exist in literature. And while we may want to use one or the other at different times, they're, they're relevant to the conversations. And there are, there are metrics and ways of measuring them and promoting them or, um, or, or not promoting or, or addressing, as in the case of burnout. Um, systems thinking. Um, and then uh, the one that I think each of you referenced um, that uh, is something that I continuously try to learn and relearn myself is authentic leadership. And the authentic leadership I think that you've all demonstrated today is superb. The authentic leadership of your organizations, of all organizations in, in the state who are, who are not just recovering from pandemic, but are building on foundations and platforms that existed beforehand. Uh, and some of the learning resiliency and agency, really agency, not just of individuals, but of organizations that's been demonstrated has just been um, very powerful. Um, and, 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 and I would I would close today's session, if I may, with just the sharing that um, one of the great joys of my career, and Cynthia, you had the son of joy on, on the tree of your activity. So, so beautifully rendered by yourself. I really, uh, I love that, that visual. But one of the, one of the real joys of my career has been found in the midst of the strife of the pandemic, which is to meet and to work with and to get to know many of you uh, and uh, as panelists and, and others who are participating in this great work in the state. I'm very much a learner, but um, it is something that, that not only gives me hope, but actually sustains me individually in my role um, as a clinician and, and within my administrative role. But but it brings great hope for me as we train and support new generations of clinicians, um, public health professionals, and continue to support all the generations that, um, that live and, and work with us and work together today. So with that, we'll close this month's session of Arizona Community Grand Rounds. Um, my heartfelt thanks to all of you for joining and to the panelists for not just your, only your, your superb presentations, but the, the great heart and spirit that you bring to this work and the work that your organizations bring. Thank you very much. Please take care, everyone, and we'll see you next month. Bye now.